So we've learned how to find the area under a normal curve using normal CDF. And then we've also learned how to take the area under a normal curve and give back the X value that would have um, given you that area, which is using inverse norm. So now we want to kind of fine tune this a little bit to a very particular normal curve, because what we've learned so far works for any normal curve, but I want to specialize it to a very particular normal curve that is very important to us called the standard normal distribution also known as the Z distribution of the Z curve. So if you remember Z scores from back in chapter three, Z scores let you know how many standard deviations away your score is from the mean. That means that if you actually score at the mean, your Z score would be zero. If you score one standard deviation above the mean, your Z score would be one. Two standard deviations above the mean, it would be two and so on. So this creates its own normal distribution. It's called the standard normal distribution or for short, like I said before, the Z curve, the Z distribution. So we'll refer to that all through all three of those names for the rest of the course. And the Z curve is really important for the rest of the course. We're going to use it in chapter eight. We're going to use it in chapter nine. We're going to use it in chapter 10. If we go on, we would use it in chapter 11. It's very, very, very important. All right, this is what it looks like. It looks like just any old normal curve, except the X axis numbers are even simpler than when it taught dealing with a standard or a non standard normal distribution. So, a non standard one, it has a mean of 20 or a mean of 50 or a mean of whatever. This has a mean specifically of zero, and a standard deviation is always worth one. So, each of the standard deviation markings is one, two, three, four, and so on. And then negative one, negative two, negative three. Okay, so we're going to use this to answer some mixed questions. And in this series, I have both normal CDF and inverse norm questions kind of mixed in for you. So the first thing it wants to know is it wants to know the percentile rank of Z equals 1.89. Now you notice earlier in the problem, it doesn't say anything about the standard normal distribution, but I don't need to. Once you see a Z in the problem anywhere, it has to be the standard normal distribution. That's what the Z curve is. Okay, so it says this magical word percentile rank. We've seen that before, but it gets confusing for people, so I've made another example of that. So we look at this decision matrix, and it says you want to find the percentile rank. You know the z-score of 1.89. That means you're going to be using normal CDF. And just like or regular normal CDF, it goes left, comma, right, lower bound, upper bound. But the mean and the standard deviation are even simpler with the z-score because it's always 0 and 1. All right, so let's go type this into a calculator. So I want to go to, oopsie, I pressed the wrong thing here. Second distribution. I want to pick number two, normal CDF. All right, now I want the lower hand edge of what I shaded. So that lower hand edge goes on forever. It never stops. That's the left hand area. If you remember in the decision matrix under note number three, it says if you have an infinite bound, if you're shading in that tail, which we are, then you're going to use negative 1E99 if you're shading the left tail and positive 1E99 for the right tail. Well, we're shading the left tail, so we're going to use negative 1E99 as our lower bound. Our upper bound is that z-score that we put down. And make sure that when you put that z-score down, you're putting it in an appropriate spot. 1.89 is almost two standard deviations away. This is what 1.89 looks like. This is computer drawn, so it's accurate. So if you have a z-score of around 1.8, it should be drawn right around there, right? Almost two standard deviations away. The mu, mu is zero, the standard deviation is one. You go to paste, you press enter and you get 0 0.9706. That means that 1.89, a z-score of 1.89, is about the 97th percentile. Because remember, percentiles, we have to round them. And our way of abbreviating that is a big capital P with a little 97 after it. Or you can just say 97th percentile, that works as well. right? All right, now this one asks for the Z score for the 72nd percentile. Mm, okay, so I'm asking for the Z score. So let me give that a green because that's what I'm asking for. And I'm giving you the 72nd percentile. Well, that 72nd is giving you a percentage. So I'm giving you a percent and I'm asking for a Z score. Let's go to the decision matrix. 
you know a percent, 72%, and you're looking for a percentile, that means you're going to use inverse norm. Ah, but we're looking for a z-score, right? Because it says we want to find the z-score. So we're actually using this special one where we get to use inverse norm left tail area comma zero comma one. Okay, so I know that 72nd percentile by definition is the percent below you. So I already know that this is the area in the left tail. Okay, so I want to use inverse norm and I want that left tail area, right? because I'm looking for that percentile. But the left tail area was given to me, it's 0.72. Now notice, by the way, where I shaded this to. Remember that the middle's value right here in the, in the center bar or the, along that central line is 50%. So 70% has to be to the right of that. Um, and it's just a bit to the right. So it's not super far over. So, and again, this is computer drawn, so you can see this is accurate. Now you might not know that it's exactly there, but you should, should not shade it too far over to the right because you need to leave 28% of the curve unshaded. So a little bit over to the right, a little bit to the left of this is fine, right? But when you're drawing and labeling and shading, you have to draw and label and shade accurately, moderately accurately at the very least. Okay, so I'm gonna grab the calculator and this time I'm going to do inverse norm. So second distribution. This is an inverse norm problem because it's a percentile problem. So 0 0.72, 0 and 1, paste, enter, enter. And I get 0.5828. Okay. So this is roughly 0.5828. Now it's important that you recognize that this value that you're finding is a z-score, which means it could technically be just about anything. I mean, it could have been uh, 2.58, it could have been 5.8, it could have been any sorts of things. Um, z does not have the restrictions on it that a um, probability does. So the answer for A, because it was a probability, had to be a decimal less than 1, right? Because the whole curve can only make 1 for area. But down here, you're actually finding z-scores. Well, there are tons of z-scores that are bigger than 1 or less than negative 1 and all that good stuff, right? So z-scores don't have the restrictions for answers on them that an actual percentage would or a probability would. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, z is greater than 1.3 or less than negative 2.1. Now notice where I've placed these. 1.3 is just a little bit past one standard deviation. So it's just a little bit further away than the inflection point. And then I shaded the area to the right of that because I want to be greater than 1.3. Or I want to be less than negative 2.1. So I have negative 2.1 shaded over here. And this is about where two standard deviations fall. So you get a visual of what that looks like. So if you're asked to do it yourself on your own normal curves, you have a vision of what that is. So negative 2.1 is not too tiny in the tail, but it's a pretty small tail. Okay, we want to find the area of both of those regions. Well, I've kind of shaded them a little bit with lines here. So I want to find that probability. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to find the central area, which I already typed all up a bit here. I'll prove it to you. So I'm going to find the central area in the middle, that kind of white um, center in the middle. I always think of it like an Oreo cookie, right? So the, the tails are the, are the chocolate cookie part, and then the middle is that double stuff, right? So I want to find the area of that. Okay, well, keep in mind, you're, asked, you're being asked up here to look for a probability. It doesn't actually say the word, but you are finding probability. That's what capital P with a parenthesis stands for. So let me go back to the decision matrix real quick. You are being asked to find probability in your given z-scores, right? That means you're going to be using normal CDF, left comma, right comma, zero comma, one, because you're being asked to find a probability, and it tells you z-scores by giving you this z 1.3 business. That's telling you z is 1.3. The other one's telling you z is negative 2.1. So I'm going to find that with a calculator and prove to you that it's 0.8853, like I said it was. So I'm going to go to normal distribution in the distribution menu. Number two, normal CDF is what you should see. Now the left-hand edge of that white um, center in the middle is negative 2.1. That's the lower bound. The upper bound of that white gooey center is 1.3. And then 0 and 1. Paste. Enter. And there it is, 0.8853. 
well, that wasn't really what I was looking for. That was the central area. But now to find what I'm looking for, I want to take one and subtract that value. Now you can either do second ANS, which is above your negative sign, or if you have a new operating system, you can actually just go up with your arrow to get that value and press enter and enter. And it's telling you it's 0.1147. Or heck, you can say one minus normal CDF and press enter and then it finds it. All right, so it's 1.1147 and there we have it. Last but not least, we have a very important calculation um, for chapter nine. And this should look familiar. It's the middle, uh, so the z-scores that cut off the middle 90%, the symmetric middle 90%. Super important for chapter nine. I'm not lying to you. You're gonna need to be able to do this calculation later. All right, so I've already labeled a whole bunch of stuff, but let's be clear about what I've labeled. So in the central, we have this 90% in here, right? And that's 0.90, right? That's your middle 90%. That means that together the two tails are the complement of that, which is one takeaway 0.9, which is 0.10 or 10%. And then to figure out what each tail is individually, what I do is I cut that 10% in half, and then I would have what each tail is on its own, which is 0.05. Right? Because remember, the entire curve, um, the area under the entire curve has got to make one because it's a full probability distribution. And we learned from chapter five that the probabilities have to add up to one. Okay, so the two tails together are 10%. Each tail individually is 5%. You label your areas above and you put your scores down below. And of course, you don't know where these are to begin with, but they're at about 1.6, but you wouldn't know that. But what you would know is that it's 90% and 5% is left in the tails. And visually, this is what 5% tails looks like, more or less. Right? I made them a little bit big for you to be able to see them, but actually I might not have. I think those are exactly where they need to be. So this is 5%. That's about what a 5% um, of the curve looks like, and that's about 5%. Okay, now let's think about this. It asks specifically for z-scores. So if we go to the decision matrix and it says you want to find a z-score, then you're going to be using inverse norm, left tail area. Unless you're given x, mu, and sigma, in which case that's actually a chapter 3 question, right? If I don't give you the normal curve and all of that and I'm just giving you values, then you could use your formulas that you learned way back in the day. Um, in chapter, uh, section 3.4, as a matter of fact, to find that. But we have an area. We were given a um, percent, namely 90%. So we were given a percent and we were asked to find a z-score. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to use inverse norm and we're going to tail it the area in the left tail. Now remember, this is kind of tricky, so I'm gonna use my calculator to kind of block us here. <laughs> okay, so the area in the left tail, if you take this vertical bar on the left, the area to the left of that is this white zone right here, which is worth 0.05. So to find that score, I'm gonna take second distribution, inverse norm. My left tail area is 0.05. My sigma, or my mu is zero, my sigma is one. I go to paste, I press enter, and sure enough, I get negative 1.645. Okay, now the right one's a little harder to see, but there's a logic that can kind of get you out of this, which is nice. See, the thing is that the area to the left of the score has got to be this full gray zone and that white zone, right? Everything that my calculator is not blocking, in other words. So that means you need 90%.9 plus 0.05, which makes 0.95. So if I do inverse norm, 0.95, 0, and 1, I should get the right answer. Interesting. They're the same number. Well, that's because due to symmetry, you don't really have to bother with the second value. Once you know one of them and have shown the calculator work for one of them, you can just say what the other one is, namely that it's the positive of the same number. Or vice versa, you could find the positive one and then not have to find the negative one because they're the same numbers. They always will be because this graph is symmetric with zero in the center. Now that's not true of all normal curves. This is only true for the Z curve. The Z curve has this property because zero is in the center of a Z curve. So our answers are 
positive 1.645 for the right hand one and negative 1.645 for the left hand one. And if you like, you can just put plus or minus symbols.